أعوذ بالله السميع العليم الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين وبعد Continue inshallah with the book The Prohibition of the Tongue and uh, last time we stopped with line 55 قال رحمه الله تعالى وسبه من سبه بأكثر من عدوه أو بدم أو بدمان مفترى he said it is prohibited upon an individual to insult or curse a person with more than what they have cursed or to lie uh, on their behalf. From what is prohibited, if someone insults you, um, first you have the right to insult him back. This is, this is a guaranteed right. Okay. If someone curses you, then you have the right to curse them back. Okay, it's like you're taking revenge for yourself. But what is prohibited here is to say more than what he has said. The Prophet ﷺ in the hadith narrated by Imam Muslim, ta'ala, he said, Al ma qala. The people who insult one another, they are judged based on what they said. ما لم يعتدي, ما لم, قال فعل البادي, ما لم يعتدي المظلوم. He said, the, the sin, the sin is giving to the person who started. As long as you do not transgress in, if you're oppressed. So we know we're not supposed to insult one another. We're not supposed to start. We're not supposed to curse one another. We're not supposed to uh, cuss at one another. This is haram. Now he's talking about revenge. If someone says something to you, then you could say something back to them. Those who take revenge after they are oppressed, then there is no means upon them or there is no sin upon them. Then you're taking revenge after you are oppressed. So why is the Sheikh saying it's haram here? What is haram? is that when you are insulted by an individual to respond more than what he has told you. So for example, if a person said, said to someone that you are dumb, then you have the right to say that to him, you are dumb. But you, if you say you're dumb and you're an idiot and you're stupid and so on, now the word you are dumb, you're not sinning for it as a revenge. Everything else that came after that, it's a sin. You understand that now? For example, he told you, uh, you look you look like that. And then you, you tell him, oh, well, you and your family and your neighbors and your relatives like that. That's haram. Why? Because his family did not insult you. So when you insulted him and his family, you have transgressed. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَمَنِ اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَاعْتَدُوا عَلَيْهِ بِمِثْلِ مَا اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ Anyone who oppress you, then you have the right to take revenge as he did. Even in Islam, like even in Islamic revenge, when it comes to rulings, if a person slaps you, what, what is better Islamically is to do what? To forgive. Okay? And that, that's, we, we, we're, not even, we're not even discussing that right now. Because the Quran is is uh, is very clear on it. Allah subhanahu wa taala said, "وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا فَمَنْ عَفَا وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ فَمَنْ عَفَا وَأَصْلَحَ." Allah said, "If a person causes sin or a mistake or harm to you, then you could cause harm back to them. But if you forgive and you try to reconcile, you get more reward. So the encouragement here for you is to do what? To forgive." Okay, but Allah said, if you take your revenge, that's your right. But if you forgive, it is better, not only better, that Allah would give you that more reward for your forgiveness. Okay, well, aslah means to reconcile or to fix. Okay, so the hadith is very clear. قال الإمام القرطبي رحمه الله تعالى قال أن يرد الجاني أن يرد مثل ما قال الجاني أو يقاربه لأن ذلك قصاص فإن قال له يا كلب مثلا فالانتصار أن يرد عليه بقوله بل هو كلب فإن تلفظ باللفظ مرتين أو ثلاثا كان ذلك متعديا Look how specific our, our scholars they talk about everything in details He said 
it is exact. I will give you an example. If someone calls you a dog, okay, you're right to respond back by saying to him that he is a dog. He said, if you repeat it twice or three times, then you have transgressed. You have done wrong. But he called me first. Yes, Allah gave you the, the, the option to do what? To take your revenge back. But he called you once, you call him once. If you repeat the same wording twice or three times, you're sinning for the second and the third time. Look how, how specified things are in, in, uh, uh, in Islam. So he said, um, and if you forgive, it is better. And he carries on all the sin. Who? The person who insulted you. So if you forgive him, he carries his sin and your sin. Not only that, that there is an angel who responds, who responds for you. If you don't take your revenge, there is an angel who responds. And we all know the famous hadith of um, um, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu wa arda. Let me just finish Imam al-Qurtubi's statement first. He said, for example, if he calls you a dog and you call him a pig, then you have transgressed. That's how deep it is. It's a serious matter. We fall into it day and night, by the way. We, we fall into this. We think we could just, oh, let me just respond. He, it was his fault. Yes, we know it's his fault. He called you a dog. You called him a pig. Now, is he wrong? 100%. Are you wrong? 100%. To that level? Yes. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu in a gathering with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a man came and he started insulting Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr Siddiq looked at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he didn't respond the first time. Then the man went on with more and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu didn't respond second time. So the man went on with more and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu didn't say um, didn't say anything. So the third time the man went on and then Abu Bakr Siddiq said, you and your father and your family, and he responded back. So the Prophet ﷺ, he got up and he left. When Abu Bakr Siddiq saw that the Prophet ﷺ was getting up and leaving, he was, he was seen to be angry. And you all know, this was obvious, we all know from the hadith, if the Prophet was happy, his face would look like, huh? that his face would be bright like the moon or the crescent. And if he gets angry, his face turns red, and you could see the anger in his face. So Abu Bakr knew, he, he's his best friend, he knew his friend very well. So when he saw him angry, he ran after the Prophet. He said, oh Prophet of Allah, you know, this man, he'd been insulting me for like 20 minutes now. And you didn't say anything, you were just quiet and everything was going normal. But then when I responded to him, you got angry. So I'm afraid that you are angry at me. He said, ya Abu Bakr. When the first time and the second time you did not respond, there was an angel who's responding on your behalf saying it's upon you. Meaning if this man told you, you, you are this, the angel will say, no, it's you who's like that. And the angel's dua is what? Is accepted. So he was defending you. When you responded, the shaitan was present. Now, and I don't sit in a gathering that has the shaitan. Okay? So... Again, defending yourself does not mean that you take, and then that's what the Sheikh was saying. He said, He said, you should not add even a lie. And you shouldn't lie, you know, and say, oh, you're, you're calling me this. You, you are this and that and this, and it's all lies. You're not even allowed to do that. Okay. Um, he said, Oh, the line after that la yuqabalu kama ibn al -arabi He said we should not respond with, with more sin And you should not cause yourself to fall into sin Because you are right If someone insults you Then he did something wrong to you He said don't fall into making a sin yourself By doing what? By lying on his behalf Or adding on something else Like Ibn Arabi mentioned Ibn Arabi said whoever attacks your honor you could attack his honor, but not his father or his brothers or his family. They didn't do anything wrong to you. Okay? So don't call, I mean, مثلا, he, he calls you a name, then you tell him, uh, you call his mother a name, مثلا. that's haram. Okay? You call him the M word or the whatever. This is haram. This is haram. Why? Because they have not done anything wrong. 
So that's what they mean by these lines. قال تذكير غضبان برب أو نبي إن كان لا يؤمن سوء سوء الأدب. It is prohibited. Look at this one. This one is actually very subhanallah. This is actually very wise. It is prohibited to remind an angry person about Allah and His Messenger if it's feared that they will have bad manners. So what is prohibited here? If someone is very angry and you feel that if you tell him something, for example, you tell him, Ya Allah, Allah said this, he's going to tell you, you know what, I don't care. The Sheikh said it is prohibited for you to remind him of Allah or the Prophet at a time of anger. Why? Because they will come back and either insult Allah and His Prophet or reject Allah and His Prophet and they won't accept it and they might add on because anger is, a, anger is the blow whistle and the... the, 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 the the whispering of the shaitan that blow, blows into a person's mind and heart. And that's why, you know, there is, we have so many rulings in Islam that is related to anger and anger management. We have so many rulings that has to do with uh, selling and buying, that has to do with marriage and divorce, that has to do with, with everything. Why anger is considered in Islam? Because an angry person we consider him sometime in Islamic law to be, anybody know, to be like a drunk person. A person who's drunk is what? Unconscious of what they're doing or what they're saying. Okay? A person who passes out, they don't know what they're doing. It, their, mind, their mind is fully covered. A person who's angry at a certain level, it is the same. His mind is fully covered, so he doesn't know what he's saying or what he's doing. So the Sheikh said, do not try to remind someone who's angry. Again, we could also apply this to um, because we, we're, we're not expect we're expecting him to have bad manners if he's reminded. Same thing. If a person is sad, try to make your advice wise. You cannot advise a person who lost his father, for example, or his mother at that time when they are burying them or when they in the janaza or something and you come and say while well, you're doing something wrong this is not the time to tell him that he's not he's not going to listen to you and the worst thing that could happen is that when he respond back he respond by rejection to the dean and then you hold him responsible for it okay you cannot come and tell him this is a sunnah of the prophet sallam now and you're doing something wrong and this is haram you're going to hellfire He's going to tell you, you know what? I don't care about this soon. Now, you caused him to do what? You caused him to say that. So the Sheikh says that you don't need to remind him at that time. If you know that his manners would lead to something like that. Anger, anger is, there is a tool to control it. And there is a great reward for those who are able to do so. The Prophet wasallam said in the hadith, whoever controls his anger, at a time, at a time where he could release it, then he's the bravest among you. And, and then he said, and whoever controls his anger, he will marry from al hur al in Jannah. And the man, when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ya Rasulullah, advise me. He said, do not be angry. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, then he said to him, he said to Rasulullah, advise me. He said, do not be angry. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, advise me three times. Then he said, do not be angry. Very simple advice. So the man said, when I went home, thinking of what the Prophet advised me, I knew that anger is the reason of every evil. And therefore, the Prophet advised me to stay away from all evil by not being angry. Why? Because anger only brings about regret. If a person is not capable of controlling his anger at a certain time, you know, a lot of time we get, we get calls from, you know, the fatwa and all that. They tell you, Sheikh, I divorced my wife. Okay? And I'm sorry, Allah, I was angry. But nobody divorces when they're happy. It, obvious. No, nobody does that. Nobody divorces when they are, like, and going out, having dinner, and enjoying their time. Seriously, I'm, I'm very serious. 
So which anger level it is considered here? It's the anger that covers up the mind that the person did not know it or realized what he was saying till after he said it. And right away he regrets saying it. This is a big problem. A mother or a father could be angry at their child and they make dua against them at a moment when they are angry and then boom, they regret it. The son could be talking to his dad or his mom and they get very angry at them and they say a word that might be a full regret in, in dunya and akhirah. Same, same case, so anger control, anger management. If you have an anger issue, try to figure out a solution to it. The Prophet ﷺ says the best that defeats anger is to make wudu. To say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, you seek refuge in Allah from the Shaitan because it's, it's the blowing of the Shaitan. Number three, you change position. If you're sitting down, you stand up. If you're standing, sit down. If you're walking, stop. If you're stopping, walk. If you're laying down, just get up and do something. Change position. It helps. All of this is from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he spoke about anger. Again, because anger is the lead of every harm, is the lead of every regret later on. So he said, do not remind someone who is angry by Allah and his Prophet unless you know that he's going to listen. A lot of time people today don't even listen to you when you advise them and they are normal. Like they're not even angry. Like if I ask, if I, if I tell one of you right now, ittaqillah, ittaqillah means what? Fear Allah. Well, how do you take it? If I tell you right now, if I just tell you, ittaqillah, people get offended. They feel very bad. They tell you, like, what, what's, what am I doing wrong? Astaghfirullah. I'm, like, I'm not fearing Allah. Why are you telling me ittaqillah? Like, what did I do? Yeah, this is the response. Tayyip. Umar al-Khattab was among those people who are very tough. And Umar, we know him. He is a little tough in his life. Okay. When a woman came to him and he was talking to her, she told him, she said, Ya Umar, ittaqillah. She said, ittaqillah. Now him being the Khalifa, the president, what could he have done? Knowing Umar, not kill her. Now, there's no need to kill a woman for saying ittaqillah. But at, at least he would be very angry. You know, if he uses his hand, that's physical abuse. That's a problem. But a person could, could get to that because he has power. He has authority too. And she told him, she said, ittaqillah, like fear Allah. Umar could tell her back, like, like, who are you to tell me to taqillah? I am, he's the best, he's the second best man after Rasulullah, by the way. He's a man that Rasulullah told him while he was walking on earth, he told him what? You're guaranteed Jannah. So there, this woman is telling me now, so we don't know who, who the woman is, and she's telling me ittaqillah. Wallahi, the Sahaba said he fell on the ground sitting, he was standing, he sat. And he started dropping tears that we were afraid that something would have happened to him. Because he knew that this word is not easy. She's telling you, ittaqil, like, ittaqil. So you have to understand the situation of the person that you're talking to and how willingly is he going to, is he going to accept your advice at, at that time uh, or another time. He said, and this is important for you to understand, it is prohibited to supplicate, to make dua, by saying something that you do not understand the meaning of it, okay? Or it is prohibited to ask for something that is haram or to, impossible to gain. So we have three things here when we make dua, and we spoke about dua before. We spoke about dua before and we said there are conditions there are pillars there are manners of dua okay there are manners of dua that we should consider for dua to be what accepted what is prohibited in dua that the sheikh mentioned here and we're not going to talk about other things we already spoke about it it is prohibited for you to say a dua that you don't understand or you don't know the meaning of it and a lot of people do that you know, especially in Ruqya and other things. It, why is it haram? Because it, the, what you could be saying could be haram. 
Like what you could be making dua with could be a terminology that you don't understand and it's not right, it's haram, it is prohibited, okay? There's a very famous dua in Arabic that people make all the time. You know, people who speak Arabic know that and I think the translation doesn't do justice to it. He said, يَقُولُونَ مَثَلًا اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي لَا أَسْأَلُكَ رَدَّ الْقَضَاءِ وَلَكِنِّي أَسْأَلُكَ اللُطْفَ فِيهِ Look, everybody knows that. So you, you say, oh Allah, um, um, اللهم إني لا أسألك رب القضاء. Oh Allah, I do not ask you to to stop or to prevent your your قضاء, what you command. ولكني أسألك, but I ask you اللطف فيه to make it easy. What's wrong with that دعاء? Why are you asking for the problem to happen? Like you say, oh Allah, I'm not asking you to stop the problem, but make it easy. Do you get it now? It's, no, you say, oh Allah, I want you to stop it. I, I don't want to deal with it. Because you do not know if you're going to be able to handle the qaba of Allah. People will tell you, oh, you know what? I want to be tested and I'll show how strong I am. Maybe you'll be tested and you won't handle it. You don't, wish, don't wish for it. Someone will be like, oh, you know what, when I get sick, or if I get sick, I'll be the most patient. How do you know? You might be sick, you might not be able to handle the sickness. You might be making dua against yourself. You may be, may, may be complaining about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his qadr. So when you say, oh Allah, you know, I, I, I don't want you to stop your qada, but I want you to send it down upon me easy. La, there's no such, because ease, ease, it, it, it's not one level. I cannot handle a finger cut. Somebody else could be a surgery. Somebody else could be... Like, everybody is different. Every human being is different. So you say, Ya Allah, just return it back. Like, stop your qaba. I, I don't want to be harmed by the qaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these, these du'as that people make without understanding what they are saying is prohibited. And he said, or taliban, and you're not supposed to make du'a of things that are haram, that are uh, prohibited. You're not supposed to say, Ya Allah, please make wine halal because nowadays everybody is drinking wine. You can't. You can. That's haram. When we say this is, this is prohibited, means what? You're not supposed to do it. You're not supposed to think that way. You're not supposed to say, I'll make dua for Allah to make something that is prohibited allowed because now we need, you know what I mean? This is prohibited. Or he said, or things that are impossible to gain. Say, Allah, yeah, yeah, Allah, I want to be able to live without breathing. I want to be able to fly. Ya Allah, make me, um, make me, I don't know. Ya Allah, I, I wish, I wish to. Even even I wish to gain a lot of money without working. I wish to like these these things that are not these things that are not possible to happen in in general in general. Okay, um, you, you say Ya Allah, uh, I I wish to live without anybody sickness. That's not even per, that's not even possible because it's the qadr of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to have every human being. No. No. Conditional dua falls into that. You say, Ya Allah, if you bless me with a child, I will do this. Or Ya Allah, no. the conditional dua, the ulama says, do not do it. You don't put a condition on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, if I pass all my classes with A, inshallah, I'm, I'm going to do this. Uh, first of all, there's two problems with that. You're putting condition on Allah and you're vowing. And vowing has a ruling. You have to fulfill it. And you might not be able to fulfill it. Okay. So you say, Ya Allah, if you do this to me, I will do this. Don't do that. Okay? Don't do that. There is a joke, but I'm not in the mood of jokes today. But Ibn Jawzi mentioned it before. He said, um, just to make the class a little easy for you guys. Um, he said, there is a person who said to Allah, Ya Allah, cure my son and I will fast three days if you cure my son. And he kept making that dua so much that Allah cured his son, so he fasted three days. After he fasted three days, his son died. So he said, okay, Allah, I will, I will subtract it from Ramadan. 
That's that's haram, very clear. Haram, haram to put a condition in dua to say, Ya Allah, if you do this, I will do that. That's that's not permissible. No. They fast with the intention for Allah to cure their children, but they should not put it into a condition. Ya Allah, if you cure my son, I will fast. No, you don't do that. Yeah. That's that's not permissible. قال وطالع ابن وطالع وطالع ابن الشاطي والقرافي لطلب المحال في الأعراف. He said some scholars have discussed the differences of the impossible, the things that are not possible to happen if they could make if you could make du'a with it or not. And he said the evidence that some scholars used is like the prophets. Isa alayhi salam he asked Allah subhanahu wa taala to send down what. Ma'idah, a full meal from heaven upon them so they could eat and they could see it coming down, which is not possible to happen like that. So he said it is permissible for things like that. Um, but what, what, what is not permissible is to say, يعني مثلا, خلاص, we, we get it. I, I wish, I just hope you guys get it, inshallah. We'll just take one more for قال كذا سؤال الناس ما لهم إذا أدى لذل أو تشك أو أذى. He said it is it is uh, uh, prohibited upon the individual to ask people for what they have if that would lead to being humiliated or complain or harm. So you should. You, he said, يعني try your best. Try your best not to ask someone to give you something unless you really need it. Or to help you with something unless you really need it. Especially if you're going to ask someone to do something for you. And they're going to always remind you of it. Keep it as a favor. Or humiliate you with it. Um, you know, or, or complain about you or cause you harm. يعني مثلا, if I know somebody who's going to give me a ride home. And this person, every time he's going to see me at the masjid, he's going to say what? Remember I gave you a ride home? Remember, I gave you a ride home. Remember, yeah, خلاص, I don't need, I'm not going to ask him again for a ride home. You understand? So that's what the Sheikh is saying. Don't, especially don't ask. There, there are people who are willing to do favors for you and they don't want you to remember it. And they, they, they would never remind you, with, remind you with it till the day of judgment. There are others who want to do a favor. They'll remind you before they do the favor. So he said, stay away from those people. Why? Because this is going to cause you harm. Or humiliation, they're, they're like Bilal radiallahu anhu Allah. Bilal was a slave, yes? He was freed by who? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu Allah. Do we have any, any narration ever that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu Allah reminded Bilal one day, even as a joke, to say, remember, you were this and I freed you. And this is, this is something big. Uh, you're freeing someone who's a slave. You know how big that is? <laughs> slavery at that time, we're not talking about... You know what Rasulullah said? Someone asked him, Ya Rasulullah, how could I ever pay my parents back for what they have done for me? He said, never, except one thing. You find them slaves and you free them. The only time you could say, I have fulfilled my parents' rights and I have done for them what they have done for me, the only time you could really say, if you, if, if you serve your parents, you spend on them, you take care of them, you provide for them, you give them money, you give them food, you buy them the best house, you, you carry them around on your back, walking. All of this does not pay back any of what your parents have done for you. So the only time you could say, I have fulfilled my parents' rights fully, is that you find them a slave, you free them from slavery. So that's a big, big, big action. But we never, Umar radiallahu anhu, when he used to see Abu Bakr Siddiq and Bilal in the masjid, he used to say, our Sayyid, Freed our Sayyid. Our master have freed our master. They're both our masters. They're both Sayyiduna. So there are people who are like that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you know, never told the Sahaba, you remember you were this and I did this, for, I, I saved you from health. Not, yeah, the reminder of, of, of certain actions because of their behavior, but not as a favor. So he said, do not ask any individual for anything that you're, especially asking them for matters that you're able to achieve okay you're able to achieve and 
you don't need someone to do it for you. Just have that izza, that honor that you want. And on the other on the other side, know that if somebody comes to you with help, Allah have provided a mean for you to enter Jannah through their help. So you're not doing him a favor. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu Allah, used to say, Wallahi, it is more beloved to me to help someone with his matter than spending hours and hours in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he used to say, I am more happy with an individual coming knocking on my door, asking me to help him out because I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have sent him to me and Allah chose me to help him out. So I, he's not, I'm not doing him a favor. He's doing me a favor because I'm fulfilling his need. So do not try your best not to ask someone unless you know that this individual would not, you know, he, a, friend, a friend would not do that to a friend or cause him harm or humiliation in front of other people. Nas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an yu'allimana ma yanfa'na wa an yanfa'na bi ma'allamana wa an May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best of knowledge to use in this dunya and in, in akhirah, inshallah, to elevate our rank in Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who hears the word and follow the best of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfect our manners. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfect our characteristics and make us among those who are guided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help and support our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate the Masjid al-Aqsa and free it from the occupation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help and support the oppressed ones in Gaza. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate their ranks, forgive their sins, to accept them among the shuhada, to cure their sick ones. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save them in their homes, in their honors, in their families. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them with mercy and tranquility and peace. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this cold nights to be warmed upon them. Allahumma ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them with better than what they have lost and better in this dunya and insha'Allah the highest level of Jannah. Allahumma ansur ikhwana al musadafina fi Gaza. Allahumma ansurhum ala tansur alayhim wa makkin lahum ala tumakkin bihim. Allahumma anjil, anjil musadafina bi fadlika wa quwatika wa rahmatika ya arhamar rahim. Allahumma zhal hadal barda alayhim amnan wa dif'an wa hananan ya kareem ya mannan. اللهم سلمهم في أوطانهم وفي أولادهم وارحم موتاهم واشف مرضاهم وسدد رميهم واجمع كلمتهم اللهم حرر المسجد الأقصى وسائر بلاد المسلمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد جزاكم الله خيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين